Hey everybody, welcome to the Shot Clock Podcast with me, Jago. Today I am joined by Basketball Ireland's commercial manager. Whatever, whatever that is, we, we may or may not get into that. Uh, UCD Marion uh, stalwart, 15 years in the Super League, one COVID season that got rained off, and one season where he went back to Division 1 for some reason. Probably just to teach the youngsters some lessons. Connor Meany, welcome to the podcast. Great to finally get you on. I know we've been trying to do this for a couple of months now. Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, thanks for, ha- thanks for having me. Um, it's, it's good to be. I've watched a good few of them and I'm glad to be finally here. Excellent, excellent. Look, the reason we bounce back and forward for, for so long is obviously with the rebrand of Basketball Ireland and the Euros and the small nations and the whole lot. You were busy. You decided to go back and play Super League again this year. I foolishly decided to do the same thing. So, yeah, we've just been busy. Us old men, like, just get busy. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's, it's good to be busy again. There was enough time there during COVID where you couldn't fill the, fill the evening. So it's, it's nice to have stuff happening well, that's again. That's true. But... Look, we'll, we'll get into how you, uh, how you filled your COVID um, a little later on in the, in the podcast. This is how I filled mine. Um, and now we're, what, four episodes into season two, which is absolutely bizarre. I've gone all pro in case you've not. I've, I've now got a ring light. Oh, nice. But my old man, big shout out to Jerry, has been giving me grief since day one going, your lighting's all wrong. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, come on, nobody needs to see me in full HD. <laughs> Clearly he wants to. I think it's the fro. I don't know. We'll just, we'll go with that. Oh, so that's good. Uh, you have the you have the jersey in the background as well, which is nice. Always there, always there. My brother got me this for my birthday, which is yes. the uh, the logo. And then my old man got me the magnet to go on my car for uh, like not a hope. There's no <laughs> way down the M50. Let people know. I'm stuck to my my people carrier. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already a target. I don't need to add uh. more to it. <laughs> I like that you have just have a single solitary basketball just in the background. That's, uh, <laughs> hey, you don't want to see what actually is around here. It's like I've had to. <laughs> That's uh, always the fear. People jump on. They're like, "What can you see?" And I'm like, "What do you mean?" They're like, "Hang yeah. on, I'm just going to move this, this, and this." Well, now you're yeah. now it's a nice clean background. I like yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So look, you're from one of those amazing basketball families. You know, um, we got to play there a couple of weeks ago out in UCD. And seeing Paul, who I hadn't seen in a couple of years, the fact that you remembered me was even better. And the fact that UCD used the shot clock warm up playlist really impressed me. I was impressed oh. with that. Yeah, there's not many of them do, due to the uh, explicit nature of the uh, of the content. <laughs> I, d- I doubt you knew that was happening. So no, uh... <laughs> I'm the clue. Thank God. Thank God for that. But look, who, what, or why made you st- start playing basketball? What what made you pick up a ball in the first place? Yeah, so uh, I guess, as you mentioned, our family have been kind of heavily involved since the beginning. So uh, dad, when he was, he went to Marion College and uh, started playing basketball when he was in school. And when they were finishing school, there was nothing for them. So they set up Marion Basketball Club and uh, he's been involved ever since that. That was in 1969 and uh so the club's still going. It's a, it's a much bigger thing now, obviously. And uh, we, when I grew up, there's pictures from as, as young as you can get with a little basketball in the back garden and everything else. So we grew up, you would have remembered uh, St. Michael's and stuff like that. So uh, we would have, like our weekends were all just hanging out in St. Michael's for the full day. Uh, I obviously have two older brothers, Niall and Kev, so it would have been kind of at their games from a very young age. And then even watching Dad, as a, uh, he was still playing until... I think Dad played 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s, uh, which is pretty pretty cool. So uh, Impressive, all right. Yeah, so we were around it like that. And then uh, my mum, uh, who's also Marion, uh, so Dad worked at Marion, set up Marion, and married Marion. But uh, yeah, she uh, she was an international swimmer, and uh, she when she came up to Dublin, had never seen basketball really before, and met Dad and started getting involved. She started running the club at underage level, and then became like a table official at international level. So it got to a stage. At one point, we had it that uh, you're talking about like down in UCD, we had it that. 
dad was doing the music. Robbie, our uncle, was kind of helping set out the stands. Me, Kev, and Niall were all playing on the team. Mum was doing table, and our uncle Michael was our assistant coach. Wow. Uh, so it's kind of, wow. uh, yeah, we, 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 and then like our, our cousins, uh, uh, like Meteors is obviously the sister club to Marion as well. So our cousins all kind of played Super League uh, with Meteors. So uh, yeah, Meanies have always kind of been very much kind of involved in basketball. So uh, I, I sometimes when I'm asked in, through work or whatever, like my connection in basketball, it's always kind of like I'm a lifer. It's, uh, it's just got that life sentence early on and I've been very, very fortunate to be part of the game uh, my whole life. Yeah, look, for as long as I can remember, there's been a meanie involved in, in Marion, you know what I mean? Whether it was playing or like, as you said, down the table or, or like your dad was always around. Always yeah, around. yeah, definitely. When like I would have played against Pat Glover, Jesus, back in the early, late 80s, early 90s, like your dad would have been just in St. Michael's. Like when you got there, he was there. That was it. And when you left, he was still there. Because there was another yeah, yeah. on after hour, under 17 game or under 19 game, whatever it was. So yeah, it's just... It's great to see though. Oh, like I always tell people that basketball is such a family sport. And it's now post COVID that you see it even more how big a family it really is. Oh, 100%. And there's there's people all over the country. Uh, like I go into I go into gyms and uh the question I'm usually asked uh, is like who's Sonny and Michael or Paul else and uh and so it's uh no it, the the connections are there through it. like you have a the Donnellys, dad played against their dad. The Grinnells is obviously the same sort of thing. And there's pockets all over the country that are like that. And uh, it's it's a cool thing to to be part of and be part of one of those kind of families and uh, be able to kind of see the history of it. Uh, like one of the things I was actually looking at the other day is uh, like CJ Fulton, even like if you want to tell the history of basketball in Ireland, you can tell it through the Fulton family alone. Like they've Absolutely. literally through yeah. Danny Adrian and CJ, you're seeing everything that Irish basketball has to tell. So there, there's there's some uh, certainly uh, some great families and uh, great people all over the the kind of country who've kept the sport going for a long time. Did you see CJ's move against Duke? <laughs> yeah, it was nice. Damn, I like, think I I think I'd injure no myself place at all. I think I'd injure myself if I tried. Oh, uh, we were talking before this came on, like, new basketball is not for me. Euro step. Not for me either. Zero so. gathers, all of these. Like, I'm trying to coach these things. And I'm going, look, the best thing you can do is just watch Puff Summer's videos because Puff will show you how to do it properly. I'll make a balls of it and you'll possibly tear your ACL. So let's just watch Puff do it because it's much easier. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, no, there, there's great stuff. Like, people are catching up and learning stuff in Ireland way quicker than we ever would have like we were so far behind where the rest of the basketball world were uh, when I was growing up and certainly when you were growing up yeah. and now kids are able to see stuff like the next day uh, as it's happening or whatever and they're able to to kind of develop so you're seeing skill sets now that were never there before but I remember like I, I pretty sure that I I think I played a season or two against Adrian at the end of his career and CJ was like the little kid on the side of the court getting those shots up. And it's kind of exactly the same sort of story that uh, like we had as a family and everything else. They're just a lot better at it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't know. Uh, I, I think it's fair enough to say. <laughs> so look, we'll say move it. on. Through your years with Marion, you've played with like all the Marion legends, I'm going to say. like it, Yeah, I, mean, I played with most of them. Yeah, I think like even Paul Cadden would have been there back when you started out, was he? Uh, yeah, he, he was at the tail end. Pork's, uh, Pork's famous within Marion because anyone who knows Pork is, uh, I'm going to say 5'5", five, five. Uh, but he was like, the, the famous story in Marion is that he was the centre of the under-13 team. It's just that nothing happened after that for him and uh, all the rest of the lads <laughs> shot up around him. But, uh, yeah, shout no, out to Hodge. Good, good yeah, referee. Yeah. One, one of the few. Yeah, so... Uh, <laughs> No, all the like, all the we we didn't get enough time with the likes of uh, Pat and Gary and those sorts. So when I was kind of coming through, um, Pat got injured very soon after kind of I started, and then kind of took a little break, and then went over to Vincent's. Obviously, 
uh, Gary kind of was there and then kind of gone for a while. So we were very young for a couple of years, but then got, got to play with kind of Barry, Kev, more of, the, more of that sort of time. Never got to play with Neville. He's the one that I, I think I would have loved to have played with, um, particularly super, young Neville. Super, <laughs> young Neville was, yeah, super basketball, brain, yeah. athletic. God, he'd, every, yeah, he'd everything. So look, yeah. based on there, who's, who's been your favourite teammate and why? Uh, I was t- trying to think it through, but uh, like I have to, I guess I have to say, we're. I was very fortunate. Like we played a year where myself, Niall, and Kev started a couple of games together, Super League, which is pretty unusual to have yeah. three brothers in the starting five. Uh, either of them, for very different reasons, were amazing teammates. Kev was one of the best passers uh, the country's seen, and could always get you exactly where you wanted it. I was always the one who was willing to shoot of the three of us. <laughs> but uh, So Kev would always find you, which was great. And then Niall was always the one who'd do all the dirty work for you so that you could uh, you could have success. So either those two. But if I went outside the family, I'd probably kind of choose probably either Foley. Foley just because we used to kill each other playing with each other, absolutely like murder each other. But at the same time, just everything he brings to the table in terms of both basketball ability, but then everything else and personality is a like a key thing to have on any team. And if it's not him, then a more understated one would probably be Dan James of the kind of more, more the younger group that myself and Dan kind yeah, of. Yeah, I forgot Dan would have played with you as well. Yeah. Yeah. So Dan came over in their twenties, and uh, so his whole career pretty much has been with me and. Uh, we would have gone to China with the select team and stuff. And uh, even outside of basketball, kind of went through everything in life uh, kind of together as well. So like he were as part of a group of us. So um, it's just one of those people that you're kind of grateful to have uh, spent a lot of time with. De- decent set of teammates, all right. So over the years, 15 seasons, like we said, who's been the toughest person you've had to guard? Yeah, so <laughs> you've already had him on the show. <laughs> and uh, he, I, I only saw him two weeks ago. I didn't tell him face to face. I'll see him again. I know I will, and I, I know he's going to say it to me. But uh, Scotty Summerskill was a little bit older when I was playing him, but I still absolutely just hated. I, I can't deal with people who are smaller than me. I just hate the idea of them, <laughs> and I hate the idea of people who run all the time. And uh, that was pretty much Scotty. He was like. He could shoot, he was fast, he was just constantly moving. And people, any of the lads who've played with me for a long time would say that I struggle guarding everybody, but my particular struggle was uh, anyone. Smaller, quicker. <laughs> yeah, like I, I'm probably guilty of falling asleep and watching what, what else is happening around the court a, a good bit, but uh, Scotty would always kind of make me pay for that. And uh, he's, he's just an amazing player. Actually, he's one of the players that, there's not that many that I'd actually have a moment that I 100% remember the first time I ever saw him. And it was uh, Vincent's preseason tournament. And my brother Kev went up for a layup and Scotty came up from behind and pinned him to the backboard. And I just couldn't understand what I just seen from <laughs> I was just like, but it was that guy. And, uh, but yeah, Scotty was a great player and uh, he definitely caused a lot of problems. Yeah, look, I get to play with him on the on the master circuit at the at the minute, or when we get back playing it. And yeah, I I love Scotty. My first meeting with him was uh, first time I played with him was like one of these all star games. But we care on Bow organized the and like I, I played I played in one of them and tried to dunk on a fast break. And people are still laughing at me. <laughs> she said, pull out. That could be. I could have the footage of that somewhere. I had I had a bump tire as I went up off my left uh, foot and just went. Oh no! <laughs> Aren't they just awful? Like, no- <laughs> well, it's the only thing I pick. it's the only thing I know. So. <laughs> So look, who who guarded you the toughest in the league? Who was the one player that you like hated on the defense matchup where you just go, oh no, I, I don't want to play these tonight. He's gonna just yeah. Uh, I I had two. So one one American, one Irish. So American was uh, Rob Taylor who played for Balna and Limerick. Rob Taylor, if he decided that he wanted to play defense, that was there was just, I just wasn't gonna do anything. There was literally nothing. I couldn't get a shot off. I couldn't drive to the basket. You know, like. And, and like kick it back out I couldn't do anything I was just like right 
this lad has got giant arms and is faster than me and I'm not doing anything. So he was he was always kind of annoying. Uh, didn't like it didn't like that. But the one that I probably had in my head more so than anything was uh, was Emmett Emmett Donnelly. That Emmett Donnelly was the first person that uh, the only Irish person that I, I can think of when I was thinking of back of this is that the night before a game that I was kind of like, oh god, <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> Emma tomorrow and. Uh, everything that like that's all right because I, I, I was a point guard for a couple of years um and i didn't I never really wanted to be a point guard but i was a point guard for a couple of years and it was just like right emma's gonna press me for 40 minutes and I'm just gonna be miserable yeah. and on top of that he's gonna be all over me and then the one time that i try and create a bit of separation he's gonna go flying and flop on the ground and, and uh, you're gonna get to, you're gonna get called every, and I'm gonna get called every, every single, single time, time. Uh, it was just like drive but is that not nuts. just is that not just the St. Vincent's point guard, like, defense? Yeah, it's... Uh, it's Because, like, like, Jay Sherlock it, was the same when I played. Jay was exactly the same. He'd be right, right up on you. And the one time you'd re- lift your arm, he'd be gone. You get the call. Coach is screaming at you, and you're going, no, no, hang on. Hang on a minute. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> it's, it's, well, it's Joey's DNA is there all over yeah, so absolutely. many of them. It's, uh, <laughs> like, Joey... That's exactly what Joey would have wanted, and uh, it's. Uh, I remember we, we we played against Joey. Joey was coaching um, a Dub- no an Irish under like sixteen or seventeen team, and we were playing a Dublin select against them. And Joey was like getting frustrated. The lads weren't playing full court defense, so up in Queens, he called a timeout, threw the ball in. Did you re- you know the stands in Queens? Those wooden stands behind yeah. the basket, right behind the benches. And uh, he got the ball, chucked it into the stands, and dove head first into the stands to show to, to show his team like what they should be doing on the floor. And you're just kind of like we're down the other end, like sitting on the benches watching this time out, just like, well, this is yeah, there you go. So it's, it's all about the characters. Oh, one hundred percent. But what you said is true. It's all it's like that's the Vincent's DNA. Yeah, it's, it's just guards are gonna get up on you and press you the whole game and. It's amazing that one coach or one person could have such an imprint on so many players for so many years, but that's Joey. And still, still doing yeah. it now with the under-20s. Like, he's yeah. still there. Still, yeah. they're, they're still learning the same thing. It's still the same DNA. It's still, like, he's still at every game doing his stats. It's like, yeah. it's just amazing to still see him. Like, you know what I mean? It's just, yeah. And it's yeah. funny because when you do see him, you get that little bit of, I'm going to make that extra bit of effort. To make Joey smile, like you're like, what, like what's going on in your head, like? But it's just, yeah. happened. it's just a natural I, thing. <laughs> I still had that for years of, uh, like Joey being my Irish coach, and I wasn't a great underage player. Like I was good underage player, but not a great, uh, like good player, not a great player. Sound like Eamon Am- <laughs> Dunphy there, but uh, <laughs> but uh, there's years after that that you'd be like, oh, Joey's watching. I have to like, I'm gonna show him that I've kind of developed into the player that I thought I could be kind of thing, which is a mad thing. It's mad, isn't it? Still a 45 on trying to impress him. Like, <laughs> and every every week he gives me grief going, when, when am I on the podcast, Jay? I was like, oh, I'll get to it eventually. <laughs> <laughs> so look, you and four are going to a pickup game. Who are you bringing with you? Yeah, so I, I decided I'd go only Marion players. Uh, yeah, okay. so, okay. and I... I decided I'd only go with one American. Um, and I actually didn't play with this American while he was in Marion. I played with him later. But my American's Jermaine. Uh, so me and Jermaine are teammates in uh, 3x3 when we are on that first European Championships team. So uh, Jermaine is just one of the great characters that ever came into Irish basketball yeah, and a great player. It's like when he first came into Ireland, uh, he went to Dungannon, but then came down to Marion soon after that. And as a kid, I was growing up watching Kev throw lobs to Jermaine, and just it was amazing to watch. And uh, so definitely, and he he kind of evolved into a better player then as years went on. Progress, yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah, definitely. So yeah. Uh, definitely, definitely Jermaine. I think I'd have to kind of. I I, I was thinking my initial plan was just to pick. Uh, 
Elaine Scully and any any of those because that's how you win this. So, but uh, but I'll just go with uh, I I think I just go with Kev, Nile, and then uh, go with Foley as well. It's just that there's always been kind of it's a good team, but it's also there's more to more to it all and. Those lads are are kind of the ones that I played with for so many years and are still a big part of my life. So yeah, that's a st- that's still a solid five, though. Yeah, yeah, definitely. If we don't, uh, we'll absolutely implode. Oh yeah, you'll all kill each other. Absolutely, it, 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 a great session afterwards. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, one hundred percent. But it's uh, it's just gonna be a matter of whether I it's Foley, myself, or Jermaine who's gonna lose it first. Most likely Foley. Foley. Hundred percent, yeah, hundred percent. Like that. No, that's no. There's no doubt there. <laughs> Absolutely no doubt. So look, we'll we'll pause it for a second and we'll go back to you know during COVID what you you spent your time doing. So for me, the podcast was born out of boredom. For you, you were a little bit more productive than I was. So talk to me. Tell me all about your new book. Yeah. So uh, I don't know about more productive than you were, but. Uh... <laughs> It's yeah. So look, I, I guess when 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 COVID started, I was looking for something. I uh, had the two little boys, and we we're kind of in the evening times. I was like, look, I just can't deal with the idea of just watching Netflix every night. So I was look. Uh, I always in the back of my head, I had kind of wanted to write something at some stage. Uh, initially, it was going to be kind of a collection of stories around Irish basketball. It kind of that's where I thought I was going, but uh, kind of evolved into something pretty different where it's, it's called Hoops Across the Ocean. It's, it's a book about really about the history of Irish international basketball. So obviously Kieran Shannon has done an amazing job of, of like hanging from the rafters. Everybody knows how, everything about the domestic game, particularly in that era. But one of the things that I always kind of was disappointed about, not this is nothing to do with Kieran, but that we don't know more of our overall history of like what what's really going on and um, particularly internationally of both players going over to the States, Irish-American players coming and playing for our national team. Oftentimes you see things where, uh, like my perception of it anyway, was that you'd see someone uh, going over to the States and it'd be like, oh, this must be one of the first players who's ever done this, this or this. And it's because nobody actually has any idea what it is and like who the first player ever to go play NCAA basketball. Most people, uh, I'd be shocked if anybody actually knows who it is um, before <laughs> until they read this book. Can I, take, can I take a stab at it? Yeah, go for it. So from what I see, you said NCAA basketball, right? So I know like, well, I'm almost certain the first player to go and play NCAA Division One was my old teammate, Niall Phelan, with Robert Morris University. So, Niall was, <laughs> was one of the earlier players, but no, it's... Uh, so, there's a lot of... First of all, there's a lot of kind of female players who went in the early 80s, and there's people that... Oh, have, Angie McNally went over. Even way earlier than that. In, no. the, in the early 80s, there was, like, people who played at Marist and different things that... Uh, like Una Gagan and things that people just don't know these names very much and it's kind of one of the things is in the same way that you were talking to me before about the reason that you did this podcast is that if you don't do it then who's going to do it and that was kind of my thing was that I just wanted to contribute something and hopefully it will add on to something else that someone else will contribute but when I was doing the research uh, it turns out that there's a, a player called John O'Donnell and he had grown up in Cork until he was nine years old, but then his family moved over to New York. And he ended up playing for Dean Smith in North Carolina, was part of a Final Four team. Um, and he went on to become uh, a professional in France, but then came back and was a graduate assistant at North Carolina until he became a doctor. And when he became a doctor, he, um, he had to give up his graduate assistant job for Dean Smith and the person who replaced him was Roy Williams. And it was his first ever job in North Carolina. Wow. Yeah, all, all from a guy from Cork. So I was very fortunate. I, I got to interview him. Um, the, the kind of backstory of how he ended up in New York is pretty crazy that 
their their families big within the GAA and Gaelic Park in New York was about to be sold by the GAA. So his uncle sold a lot of property to buy over Gaelic Park. And as a, as a result, uh, John's family um, all moved over there to kind of support their uncle who was doing it. And he picked up basketball and became a Tar Heel. So it's, it's crazy. See, like there, there's just stuff that people like it's this is we're talking about like mid late 70s when this is happening and uh but like people don't know that no. and it's kind of we're so far removed from it that uh, the worry would always be and where i originally wanted to go with the short stories was that like i've heard stuff from dad and different things that are interesting stories and the worry is always going to be that when these generations are kind of gone that those stories go too are gone so, with them, yeah yeah, exactly. So that's why I initially started. But um, it, the other thing that it, the main focus of it really is our national team. And um, like it, it's really interesting now with the uh, both the national teams going back into Eurobasket. So it really focuses from kind of early 90s until the teams were scrapped in, in 2009. And um, throughout that kind of time, there was a huge amount of Irish Americans coming over and playing. And why I wrote it originally was that I, I met like through work and a couple of different things. I, I met Pat Burke quite a bit and uh, got talking to him. And one of the things that fascinated me was that his NBA career is probably the least interesting part of his career. He has like just an incredible career where winning Euro leagues, winning uh, kind of titles all over Europe, playing for Panathinaikos, Real Madrid, all these sort of places. And, um, my own perception of it was that when we watched those national teams back in the day that we didn't fully get behind them because we didn't have a clue who we were watching we knew that these were lads were good basketball players but we didn't really know what that meant outside of maybe you kind of knew marty conlon pat burke jay laranaga you might know those sort of people but the next kind of group of them people don't know anything about so um like a good example of it is uh, Jim Moran. He coaches in in the league at the moment. He's an assistant coach in the NBA. Uh, he was at the Trailblazers for a number of years. He's with the Pistons now. He's he was the first person ever to have his jersey retired by Grand Canaria in the ACB. And when they did, uh, they played U two music, and he's known he's known as the Irishman. And he has an identity as an Irish person in Spain. And yes, in Ireland, we don't know anything about him. And so what I wanted to do was try and tease out some of these guys of what their backgrounds were, why they wanted to play for Ireland, and then the impact that it had. So the impact wasn't all amazing. It, like there was negatives as well. So uh, you mentioned Niall Phelan there. There's a generation who kind of were probably didn't get the same opportunities in the national team that they might have got otherwise guys like Mick Richardson uh, they got a couple of opportunities with the national team but didn't quite get as many because we had so many uh, guys coming in because oh, yeah, yeah. yeah like by 2005 we played some European championship games with no Irish developed player on the team which is a kind of crazy thing for it, it to have happened we're so, such a small nation as well like to, to yeah. turn, turn your back is the wrong phrase but like you know look elsewhere yeah we exactly. have like some serious talent back then as well yeah definitely so one of the challenges that was coming up was that um as we were increasing the level that we were able to compete at the requirements of players was increasing all the time and it became really difficult for uh players to be able to even get the time to be able to play so gareth Maguire and adrian fulton are two of like our most capped players and the north used to give uh time off uh, from work to players to represent the country that they were going to play for, whereas in the South, nothing like that happened. Mm -hmm. So outside of Damien Seeley, there was very few people who were able to actually give time to the national team in that same way. So it's, uh, it, I talked to the Americans who were involved and the Irish guys who were playing and kind of like, at the time, what perception they had. And even the Americans were aware of, like, that it wasn't all positive. And they were kind of, they knew themselves that they thought that they were there as a short term fix to a longer term goal. But it kind of, the, there was no real strategy to make it that longer term goal. It was just kind of the short term fix. Short -term fix. So, yeah. So it's, uh, 
the, uh, there's 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 interesting stuff throughout it. It's like I, I'll tell you one other one. I'm uh, I'm not going for all the spoilers, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> do we need but, do we need to put spoiler alert? Yeah, spoiler <laughs> alert. But uh, now hold on, hold on, hold on. <clears throat> for anyone who doesn't want to know the plot, of the book, <laughs> yeah, yeah. lower lower down your radio now. <laughs> <laughs> so. Uh, I said they tuned out ages ago. Anyway. <laughs> uh, but um, no, like you'll probably remember uh, the name John Burke. So oh, like, we got to play against John. Yeah, so he, yeah, our Irish team, our junior men's Irish team played against the senior team. I'm gonna say was John around ninety three, ninety four. He would have been. Yeah, he was in yeah, the states yeah. so at that we, stage we and kind of just him, came yeah. back. Yeah, so. Uh, John Burke's a name that not a lot of people will will know, and uh, he's was kind of this project player for end of birth. It was six eleven, uh, developed into a player. Ended up going off to the states, did pretty well in the end. Uh, played professionally in Greece and, and another couple of countries as well. But the amazing thing, uh, John's based over in the in the states now as a high school coach. But like. To, this is bananas, but, but <laughs> John John played uh, John played a season in Sweden, okay, and uh, the team was called Magic M Seven, okay, and the reason they were called Magic M Seven was that Magic Johnson was the owner of the team, so he bought over a team in Sweden. He did the same thing the year before in Denmark and played a season over there. It was his way. This is in kind of around ninety nine two thousand, I think. I'd have to check the year. But it was his way of trying to grow the game, and he play uh, or he buy over a team anyway. But the year he bought over Magic M Seven, he was the starting point guard for a number of games, and John was the starting center. So John Burke <laughs> from Nace was in the starting five. A video of us in the starting five playing alongside Magic Johnson. It's like just a ridiculous thing, to, like absolutely bizarre. Yeah, absolutely bizarre, and it's like he has he has unpu- unpublishable stories about uh, their time together. But it's just it's wild when you even I just think it's it's interesting again with Eurobasket uh, around now. We're looking at guys and we're kind of going, oh, it's great to see guys playing uh, abroad and everything else, which absolutely it is, and yes, we. I'm a, I'm a big person of, I think it's really important to have context about everything that Absolutely. you're looking at. And that's not to say what's happening now is not good. What's happening now is better, whatever. It, it's, it, that's not it. It's just to understand that other things have happened in the past. And I just think it's so interesting, the idea that like there's a guy playing professionally with Magic Johnson as his point guard and he's from Nice. And if you asked the basketball community about that, no, I'd be... I'd be shocked if there's 10 people in Ireland who yeah. could kind of tell you that sort of thing. And uh, there, there's also the, one more for you is that uh, I won't go into the story properly, but the lads used to play World University games as well. And uh, they played it three times and they played the States um, in competition once and then in warm up games twice. But in 1995, the lads were playing against the States and the States starting five was Al Iverson, Tim Duncan, Ray Allen. Uh, that, that was like three of the starting five that were there. And it's just like... Who and was we that have got, starting five? Was that like Fulty? Yeah, Fulty was there, yeah. Like John, was there. John O'Connell and some of the Americans that were there back then. And uh, Pat Burke was injured. But it's just like, there's all these things that like, it's just wild when you, when you actually think back that like there's people like uh, Fulty who... That's what I was saying about the Fultons earlier on. Like you can track the his the whole history of the sport from the early development of like the national teams and everything else. Danny Fulton's coach, and he's going over to other countries trying to get more education to bring it back to try and raise the standard. Adrian then comes through of the generation that start competing at junior men's level, go in, win the promotions cup, go into the qualifiers. He's there all the way up through when we're competing against like Germany in the semi-final round of the European Championships himself and uh, Gareth Maguire sitting on the bench watching like as NBA players are playing against each other. And then you kind of, there's the little dip off for a few years when stuff isn't happening. And now 
this new wave of all this talent is coming through and it's CJ is right there. Leading. And Adrian's on the sideline. And Adrian's on the sideline. It's, it's, it's incredible. So, um, and I know I focus a lot on the, the men's side, but I do look at the women's side as well. And they have very different, they had a very different journey because there simply wasn't a lot of professional opportunities in Europe for Irish Americans. So there's very few Irish American females came and played. So instead we sent a lot of girls over to the States play, they played and then they came back and were part of the domestic game and played. And part of what I'm looking at is some of the stories of the people who went over to the States. So looking in depth at like Susan Moore, but also even back in the eighties, some of the earlier ones that, uh, like Maggie Timoney and some of those sort of people, uh, names and I, I my big thing about it all is just like I'm not a I'm not a professional uh, like I I'm not a writer I, I write I'm able to write but I've done this as a way of hopefully leading someone else to keep following it on and adding their piece to whatever they can do within the game is is my approach and uh, I, I know it's your approach of just whatever your skill set is, if you can add something to the story, just do it. And uh, you, you don't need to worry about what people are going to think of it. And uh, it, overall, the, the stuff's going to be positive and it's going to add something else. And even if it's not the right thing to do, then it will lead someone else to hopefully do the right thing. And uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Look, I, like, hold on. Hold, hold up the book. Let people see it. Let, let them see the copy. So there we go, Hoops Across the Ocean by Connor Meany. So on the... 1st of December is... 1st of December in, in all good bookstores, is that what we're going with? Uh, it's going to be... So the website's going to be hoopsacrosstheocean.com and you can get it through the Amazon, uh, it, like Kindle Direct. So you can get it as a, a printed copy or you can get it as a, a Kindle copy. I've always wanted to do this. There will be a link in the bio. Oh, nice. Oh. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I've always wanted to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. what a pro. <laughs> so look, I, I, I want to say on on my behalf, thank you for writing this book because without storytellers, stories die. And as you said, if if one kid picks up a book, I know Jackie Hurley's book, um, Girls Play and Girls Play Two, yeah, has has gone on to you know inspire a generation. And if if your book in in whatever amount of weeks, months, years, somebody picks it up, reads about John Burke, reads about Susan Moran, reads about Una Gagan, all of these people, Noel Field and whoever, and picks up a basketball and, and, and just goes to their local park and shoots, you know what? You've passed the torch and you've done the right thing. So on, on my behalf and on future basketball players' behalf, thank you very much for writing this book. I'm, I'm looking forward to it like yeah it's yeah, on, yeah it's on my christmas list good stuff definitely yeah oh uh, yeah absolutely right so we'll get back to our regular our regular podcast now now that we've done with the book plug i feel like oprah winfrey <laughs> yeah yeah this is you, you you've got fully commercial now you know there goes book club just to take a take a moment for our, the sponsors <laughs> yeah. here that's yeah that's exactly it this segment was brought to you by <laughs> who's your publisher uh, my, well, myself and Amazon. Yeah, so. there you go. Doing it for yourself. <laughs> That's it. Take all the royalties. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so look, back to this. Any superstitions? Uh, <laughs> or have we enough time to include your yeah, superstitions? I don't, you definitely don't have enough time. I said it to Lindsay earlier on. I was like, do I have superstitions? And she just started laughing in my face. And uh, she's like... <laughs> Like we can't walk down the road and I look at a magpie. If I see a magpie, I spend the next five minutes trying to find the second magpie. Right, so, yeah, where are they? And she's like, Oh, if you see one magpie, it's like, Oh, we're gonna lose the cup. I can't believe this and everything else. So uh, uh I'm a, I'm a bad man for it. It's uh from like same seat in every gym, if I can in the changing rooms. Uh it's like a packet of wine gums and a Luke's aid every time I'm I go to any game. It's uh, the first two layups in the warm up is the same two layups. It's uh, everything. It's uh, 
<laughs> and that's that's the ones that I'm comfortable telling people about. So, uh, so, you, so you have a Jermaine Turner dirty sock story? Is that what you're telling? Oh, uh, there's there's a pair of Under Armour that went on beyond their their use by day just because we we won a big game with them. So, yeah. was, that the, was that the league winning season or the cup winning season? The cup winning season, and I tried to. It almost made it to the league winning season seven years later, eight years later. <laughs> How are you fitting into the same shorts after seven years? <laughs> no. <laughs> like, that's a feat in itself. Yeah, good good really. job, you. Got the COVID change there. <laughs> uh, and kids. I'm going to go with kids first. <laughs> yeah. Because there's all that, you know, well, if you have one, I'll have one. Oh, uh, 100%. <laughs> you know. Gotta be a, you got to be a good father first. Oh, that's exactly it. Well, have you got two boys? Yeah. Have they picked up a ball yet? Uh, they're, they're three and two. So yes, they have. They we, we, <laughs> I, I have a size one here somewhere for them. Yeah. Excellent. So, yeah. so there will be a mania involved in Marion for many, many years to come. Well, we live out in Rohini, so we're right beside Cluster now. So, uh... no, 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 no. <laughs> in those games, no, 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 no. That's now there'll be trouble. Like, Jesus, uh, Marion Co- Marion College is only fifteen minutes from here, so we're still grand. Back over with the sound, you Jesus. That's... Yeah. Have any of that? So, if you could get any company to make you a pair of runners for the rest of your career, the rest of your life, what are your favorite sneakers of all time? I used to get grief because I only wore pro models for about seven years. Uh, so Adidas pro models were wow. just the they most comfortable. Most comfortable, didn't care about anything else. It was just like, I just want pro models. Uh, wouldn't think about anything else. As cool as I got was being the ones that were, you were able to switch the colors and uh. But no, it's never a big, never a big kind of person who thought a lot about them or anything else. Found pro models and just decided, yeah, this is it. And spent the next seven years just uh, happy out. And then uh, changed to Under Armour for a year and had a stress fracture in my foot the, the following year. So hmm. I saw one magpie at the start of that season <laughs> and uh, it, it screwed it came me. Back so. to haunt you. Yeah, yeah. So no, I, I, I was never really like even now. Uh, I think pair of Paul George's. I think uh, I don't. I don't like Paul George. <laughs> so, uh, but his uh, shoes were cheap. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they love. Uh, they were nice and blue for Marion. So uh, no, it was never a big thing. Low cuts. Are you? Are you into? Like, were you a local person all your career? No. no. I picked up a pair. I'm raging at it. They're out in the hall. I'm not going to go and get them. I got a pair of Nikes about two weeks ago. And I wore them to training. And like five minutes in, I walked over to Garrett Winders and went, I, I can't practice tonight. And he went, why? And I went, these are too low. I'm going to break my ankles. It's all those Euro steps you're doing. It and he's world. looking at me going, you'll be fine. I'm like, no, no. <laughs> so I literally sat out practice. And then came back the next week with like two l- lace up ankle supports. <laughs> <laughs> They're just far too low. I don't know how people play in them. It's just, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> am I getting old? I am. Is yeah, that, is that the sign that, of getting old? That's, that's, what, that's one of the oldest stories I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> Only 10 years between us. Give it over. Yeah. <laughs> right, shift in lane. Music. Top five musical acts of all time. I, I have dodgy musical taste. I'm kind of... It's eclectic. How, how I, Oh, like it's probably a net, like a girl's uh, now. <laughs> yeah, that's what I call music. Uh, uh, like my main stuff is kind of your normal kind of Bruce, Mumford and Sons, all that sort of stuff. Okay. Uh, but then I listen to I listen to strange like I listen to a good bit of dance music, um, and then it, it's weird you, when I'm working. I listen like I try to listen to as much stuff where I'm not singing along to it. So uh <laughs> <laughs> bopping away. So uh like everything from John Williams kind of that sort of like all kind of composed stuff to uh like French uh, like Indila Stramai, all this sort of stuff. Yeah, it's just weird. I said it's weird. Uh so like and then yeah you come at home and I'd I'd have like Irish kind of ballads and stuff going on. So just I, I don't have like a set set of music that I'm always listening to or anything else. It's just and I don't like 
I wouldn't go to a lot of gigs or anything else like that. I've never been a big music person, but I kind of, for different stuff, I'm always like just picking away at different things. That, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So just, yeah, random stuff. Very random. I love, ran- random's great. Look, if you listen back and go through the episodes, like we've had everything. Credence, Pearl Jam, like, e- like there's everything. Like, well, like John Williams and some French composers. That's the best, yeah. Uh, French is uh, not French composers. French, it's even weirder. It's like there's French rap and stuff that uh, French wow. rap, unbelievable. It's uh, I'll send you, I'll send you a thing uh, afterwards and you can listen to uh, it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, I'm I'm nearly scared asking this question, but you're the DJ. What are the last three songs we're warming up to? <laughs> so. Uh, first of all, I would not be allowed anywhere near it. That's very clear from everybody. I I I'd go fully like dance, so it'd be like uh, Tiesto, Adagio for Strings, uh, Zombie Nation, Current Craft Four Hundred, and then I don't know what the other one. I have there's a song moving on Piquito. I, I don't know if you know who that is, but uh, it's just this. A mad dance one that uh, is good for games. I'll send it, I'll send you that one. Send as me well. that one. Uh, it's kind of yeah, it's it's good. It's kind of like Zombie Nation, but uh, anything like that where it's just kind of fully let's go kind of thing. It's uh, up and running. Yeah, yeah, which it takes a while. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. but um, no, I wouldn't be that uh, like I I kind of in my own world a lot of the time when it's uh, as we're coming close to the game. Uh, I guess it's because I have so many superstitions I have to get through my checklist. Get through, yeah. Get through your <laughs> yeah. superstition set list before you yeah, yeah. do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I will tell you, though, that we had an entire season where uh, Kev Foley was in charge of our warm-up. And he, I don't know if he, he won't even deny it because he's proud of it, but we listened to a full Matchbox 20 album. <laughs> this is our warm up song. And he wouldn't let people go and change it. It was like, no, this is great music. And it's like, yeah, but like, like I don't understand this. It's like, are we trying to like psych out the other team or what's going on here? It's just like, no, it's like, it's just good songs. And it's like, okay. Somebody needs to explain what a warm up playlist is to Kev. That's the problem. Yeah, exactly. I need, I need to get over to a Malahoy game just to see what they're playing over there. <laughs> There's no way he's allowed near the music. Uh, no, certain people should be just banned from the music. Like yeah. yeah, that is a real. I, I'm looking forward to adding your tree onto the uh, onto the playlist, just to see how many see how many more hits we get. Oh yeah. So, here's the here's the philosophical one. What advice would you give to a 16 year old Connor Meany? Uh, I, I think there's there's probably two. One is uh, kind of stay true to yourself. So. I kind of, I think I touched on it earlier on, particularly basketball-wise, I had what I thought I was going to be as a basketball player, but I wasn't it as an underage player. I was fairly soft, and I was kind of, I wasn't strong enough to do what I wanted to do, but yet I kind of still believed that I was going to be that person eventually, and I think as an adult, I've been a much better adult player than I was as an underage player because I stayed true to that. So that would be kind of my basketball specific one. My my more general one is my just try and say yes to as many opportunities as that come up and don't worry about where it's going to take you. So I still am way, really bad at this of trying to calculate the next five moves that it's going to, like if I say yes to this, it's going to mean this, this, this and this and worrying too much about that but if you just where wherever possible say yes and you may regret a small number of them that you do stuff that you maybe didn't want to do or maybe regret doing but by and large the amount of things that I've said yes to that opened up doors for me that would never have kind of opened up otherwise our conversation starters to something else um is is definitely something that I I I need to keep, I need to tell 35 year old me uh, <laughs> as well, but it, it's, I definitely tell 16 year old me, it's just like, stop worrying about all the different possible things that could happen and you're not gonna be able to predict it anyway. So wherever possible, be adventurous, take those opportunities because 
they're not always going to be there for you. Uh, solid advice. Solid, solid advice. I am very similar to you in everything has to be calculated. Yeah. Every, like, I'm, I'm planning, a, planning a trip to London in February and already I'm picking restaurants. Why? Yeah. Why? Yeah, the yeah. restaurant's not going anywhere. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just, just go over and, 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 and fall into it. You know, like I'm, I'm, earlier on, I'm sitting right now and right and I can go there and that's 20 minutes from here. So that means I can kill that and that in the one day. And listening to this now, I'm going, yeah, just go for it. Rip yeah. up your itinerary. <laughs> yeah, I remember 2012, uh, Shane Whelan, I don't know if you remember, was working Basketball Ireland and uh, he asked me to do the TV coverage for Satanta because uh, we had won the cup the year before. And I was like, terrified of the idea of it um, but I was just like yeah look I'll do it let's see what happens went for it and about a couple of years I think it was like two years later I ended up getting a job and the reason that I got the job because the person told me was that they're like oh we saw that you had done stuff on tv and that kind of spoke to the idea that you could uh, present in front of like senior executives and different things and it's like it's amazing just how stuff like that happens and it just it seems to organically happen but it can only ever organically happen if you put yourself in that position absolutely absolutely and i like i remember you doing the, the commentary for the games and i was delighted that, that was again something that we kind of alluded to a couple of times a basketball person talking basketball i love when matt hall is on commentary i love when nave dwyer is on commentary i love when suzanne mcguire is on commentary it's they know what they're talking about so you're not going, what is he, what's he on about? Like they're breaking down pick and rolls and you're going, absolutely, that's exactly the way I would have defended it as well. Yeah, exactly. so yeah it just makes much more sense. Yeah. I'd love to see Basketball Ireland come back with their own channel. That's, that's where I am now. Let's get back to the, the old timeout TV show and, and, and go from there, Mr. Commercial Manager. <clears throat> <laughs> I know a guy who's available. Anyway. <laughs> So look, second last question: Dead or alive? Five people for dinner, friends, family, or famous? Who are you inviting? Uh, yeah, so I was thinking about this, and uh, I guess in the context of what we've already talked about, this won't come as a, a huge surprise. But I, I'm going to cheat with the amount of people. But what I'd like is to have both my sets of grandparents and my parents, um, and it would be like a Christmas dinner, but just having that conversation. So uh, when I was talking about the book and stuff earlier on, it's like how context matters. It's a big thing in my, in my mind and having that conversation with my grandparents, my parents and myself about what Ireland's like now, what Ireland was like back then, things that have changed, what they kind of had hoped for, for a generation that came after them and everything else and where we're at now, all that sort of stuff. Just is stuff that I I find interesting. It's like fascinating. Yeah, yeah. I I I went to tell Lindsay uh, uh, earlier on, and uh, she was like, "Oh, you're not going for any famous people." And I was like, "Yeah, but like a famous person wouldn't tell me anything at the dinner anyway." She's like, "It's an imaginary dinner where you're." <laughs> it's like, it's like you're, you're you're not Lindsay on. I was like, <laughs> I was like, there I am. They're still walling me on my own dinner that I've uh, that I've set up. <laughs> Like, answer well, the damn question. your questions <laughs> <laughs> so i uh, hopefully my granddad and granny will uh, answer my questions but uh, uh yeah it's uh i i think it's uh, i of my grandparents is only kind of one of the four that like even in my late teens was still alive so i just would like to have those conversations I, i'm always asking like my uncles and my my dad and mom about the generation before them and some of that so i i just find that to be interesting yeah absolutely i'd love i'd love to get their take on on the world now yeah exactly like, they'll be looking at you just kind of going are you are you serious with that hair yeah well that's that'll be the first one get your hair cut you hippie all right sorry okay no problem well after that let's talk yeah, well, yeah. imagine sitting down with your grandparents going right so in 2020 the world locked down for 20 months yeah. because of a virus and they'd be like should we have them every day <laughs> yeah 100 and it's just 
I, I just think it's interesting the the idea of what we go through on a day by day basis, and then also, I'm sure. I, I guess it's when you have kids as well that you start thinking more about like, geez, what what's it going to be like in thirty years' time? When what are they going to be experiencing? And uh, I'm sure my parents are thinking the same thing about my my children. So I just, absolutely, yeah. Think about it, man. You are both older than YouTube. That's that's the way to put it in context. We are both <laughs> older than YouTube. If you said that to your kids, they would think you were ancient. Yes. <laughs> what do you mean you had no YouTube? What did you do for entertainment? <laughs> so look, last question. And firstly, I just want to say again, thanks for writing the book. I'm really looking forward to it. I hope everybody in the basketball community goes out and embraces this. Um, it's one of our own. Go and, go and buy the book. You know what I mean? Like, do it out of takeaway. Buy two of them. You know what I mean? Just give it to somebody. Spread the word. Spread the word. Good man. Thank you. I'll come on board as your PR man. There's absolutely no problem. <laughs> um, well, look, I'm delighted we finally got to sit down and, and do this because you're one of the interesting characters in basketball. You know what I mean? You've always been there. Through my whole career, there's always been a meanie somewhere. You know what I mean? <laughs> just, just, just lurking. There in the back, lurking in the background. So, yeah, I'm delighted to finally. And again, finally getting to sit down with another Marion man. Uh, I'm, I'm lining up Scotty uh, Kenavan. Oh, good man. Yeah, it's good, that, it's good that he's considered a Marion man now. Ah, he's been a Marion man for a long time. <laughs> even even before, even when he was with Limerick. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I know. It's like Scotty, me and Scotty go back to the start of his basketball career because he, he grew up around the corner from me. So yeah, Craig, um, Craig's only Craig's year. Is Craig my age? Craig's your age. Yeah. 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 Yeah, my my lazy my lazy Division Five playing brother. Yeah, <laughs> pains me pains me to see that he won't play higher. He's but too hey, focused. He's too focused on planning his Halloween costume each year and his Christmas costume as well. It's oh. the, the Christmas is the twelve pubs of Christmas one that really. <laughs> that's the one that that's the one that takes the. Oh, amount. sorry, it was it's the selection box? That's selection the one that box made the them famous. One, yeah, that still goes viral every single year. <laughs> Absolutely hilarious, and he made all them himself in my ma's kitchen. Good stuff. <laughs> I'll, I'll put the picture up for those of you who don't know what we're talking about. <laughs> I will add the picture in. So, look, last question. Who would you like to see on the podcast and can you help get them? <laughs> uh, I'll give you two. Uh, one I can help. Uh, first one I can't help was you've mentioned him already yourself, Niall Phelan. Uh, get feel of one, yeah. I just there's there's people of a generation that are your generation are just even slightly younger than you. That Niall was one of these people that he's kind of one of the first really athletic kind of big stars that was coming through. I'm so, even a couple of years later, Kieran Dempsey was kind of like similar sort of thing. Yeah. And they kind of exploded out and were really good, and then we didn't get to because we didn't get to see the rest of their career they kind of are gone from people's memories a little bit, but uh, it'd be good to hear either of those. And then the other one is my own generation, which is Phil Taylor. Uh, <laughs> Phil is, I would say, Phil's probably had the opposite career to me, is that he, I think he did say this himself, is that he was like a, a solid adult player but he was like unbelievable uh, when it came to kind of under 18s and stuff. And uh, unfortunately, when he went away, just the path that he went on, it, it, he never found the right situation and different things. But Phil was so talented and uh, had so much ability and it's just a gas character as well. So uh, he to come on as, a, as a, my personal trainer at the start of the season. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I'm still waiting to ring him back. I've been very, very busy. He, uh, <laughs> I, I saw videos yesterday on Instagram. He's uh, oh, stretching, trying to do the splits. Yeah, he, he's getting his stuff back. Yeah, he's always. His, I think his dad was into was it karate or karate something? or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah something like along those. Yeah, so yeah. he's always had that side to him. That, uh, but yeah, Phil, Phil will be a good one, and oh, it's it, another person that I think that people probably forget about. Uh, but he. 
particularly at underage level, but even in those first few years of Super League when he was playing, uh, he was really good. And you can also ask him about the time that he tried to fight Kenny Gamble and Vincent. And, uh... Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why would you fight Kenny Gamble? I, I'm pretty sure the I'm pretty sure I have it right that this is the uh, the thing that uh, Kenny Gamble just turned around and was like, "You, you better know your weight class, boy." <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like Kenny, all right. What a line. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Look, I have to get Phil on just to hear that story. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that that's the right one. But uh, he definitely did try uh, when he was only like 17 or 18. Now, there's only going to be one winner there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> and that's whatever, whatever plastic surgeon Phil had to go to after. <laughs> Look, Connor, thanks a million for coming on. Um, again, best luck to book. Link in the bio for where you can get it. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll push this as much as we can and hopefully, you know, your sales go through the roof and you don't forget me. Brilliant. Thanks a million, Jago. Cheers, man. Talk to you soon. All right. All the best. Thank you.